Coming great separation of souls, Pastor Rick Wiles. Morning Manna. Lesson 1. Well, welcome to Morning Manna. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Hey, it's Monday morning as I record today's Morning Manna. And minutes after arriving at our church, I was informed by our director of social media that YouTube has banned True News from loading new content for two weeks. This is strike number two against True News. What was my offense that justified punishing True News? Well, listen to this. The YouTube Thought Police cited a True News program from 2014 as the offensive material. It was my interview with Wolfgang Haubig, a former Florida state police officer, U.S. customs agent, and public school security consultant. Several weeks ago, YouTube censored a program I recorded over one year ago about the Armenian genocide when the Turkish Muslims slaughtered 1.5 million Armenian Christians. I don't know if they censored me for saying that Muslims murdered Christians or for calling it a Holocaust because the Zionists own that word. Regardless, they censored us and removed that program. Now, the YouTube thought police are combing through years of content, going back years and years to find something that offends them. My friend, this is what Nazism looks like up close. The YouTube thought police are modern day Nazis. Free speech is being eliminated in America in 2018. Perhaps you've noticed that one or two of your favorite content providers on YouTube aren't there anymore. You may have asked yourself, wow, did, did he quit or did she go away? No, he didn't quit and she didn't go away. YouTube's thought police banned them. People are disappearing from YouTube. Over time, nobody will be on YouTube who disagrees with the all-seeing, all-knowing, politically correct communist thought police. Now, I saw this day coming years ago, a time of censorship in America, and it's happening now. The left is censoring the right. The left is censoring Christians. The godless are censoring God-fearing saints. Well, there's something we can do about it. First, we can stop using YouTube and its parent, Google. We can stop using Facebook and Twitter. You know what? Life goes on without them. True News was here before Google. True News was here before YouTube. True News was here before Facebook and Twitter. Let them go out of business. Who cares? Anyway, I needed to inform you about this matter today. If you are one of the thousands of people who watch True News on YouTube, we won't be there for the next two weeks. We may never be there again. Quite frankly, I don't know if you'll ever find us on YouTube. If they're going back years to examine content, I'm sure they'll find something else that offends their sensitive little millennial snowflake leftist minds. Who cares? There's something else you and I can do. We can build our own social media platforms. And I've got news for you. This is good news. We saw this day coming years ago and we started working on building our own platform. It is Prazer. And Prazer 2.0 will be released months from now. We invested years of hard work and a large sum of money donated by our supporters into building the Prazer platform. God's people will have their own social media platform where the word of God is welcomed and celebrated, not scorned and censored. Now, I must alert you at some date in the near future, True News and Morning Manna will not be available on YouTube, Facebook, or any of the other social media platforms. Either they are going to take us off or I'm going to take ourselves off. Our content will be available only on our own platform where it cannot be censored. For now, I encourage you to use truenews.com 
to see the True News program and Morning Manna. Morning Manna is on truenews.com. And then in a few months, our new Praiser platform will be released and Morning Manna will be there also. Okay, let's get to the lesson. My topic today and for the next several days is the coming great separation of souls. This is part one. You and I are living in the final days of the last days. Now, the last days started over 2,000 years ago when Jesus was crucified, buried, and resurrected. We've been in the last days for 2,000 plus years. Jesus and the apostles told us how people would think and act in the last days. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, St. Paul said, We must know that in the last days perilous times shall come to the church. He said that people will be lovers of, them, of their own selves. They will covet. They will boast. They will be proud. They will be blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, and incontinent. Now, what does that word mean? It means they lack self-control, especially in their sexual desires. They will be fierce, despisers of those who are good. They'll be traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Listen, if you don't believe me, just read stuff that people post on social media. There's the evidence. They've already become these things. St. Paul said people in the last days will be forever learning, yet never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You know why? They can't accept this book as the truth, the Word of God. They're always seeking knowledge, always seeking some revelation, but they can't accept this book as truth. He also said that evil men and seducers will become worse and worse, deceiving others and being deceived themselves. Well, that describes today. Likewise, St. Peter admonish Christians to not be discouraged by the worsening attitudes and behavior of people in the last days. He said that there will be scoffers and mockers of the Christian faith. In 2 Peter chapter 3, he said, scoffers shall come in the last days who walk after their own lust. They will mock Christians by saying, where is your Jesus? We've heard for years that Jesus is coming. Where is he? They're going to mock, and they're doing it right now. St. Peter said that they willingly ignore the truth, that God judged wicked humanity with a great flood in the days of Noah, and that the earth and the heavens have been reserved for fire on the day of judgment. He said they willingly ignore this truth. Apostle Peter said the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a loud noise and the elements of this universe will be destroyed with intense heat. The earth and the works in the earth will be burned up. Now on a side note, that verse by Peter obliterated the doctrine taught by dispensational premillennial pre-tribulational Zionists that teach that there will be a thousand year Israeli kingdom ruled from Jerusalem after Jesus returns. Peter said this present earth and the heavens will be consumed with intense fire and heat. And I've got news for the Zionists. The whole Middle East, including Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, will burn up and disappear on the day of judgment when Christ returns. What the church of God should be doing right now is preaching that the great separation of souls is coming. And that separation of souls will happen on the day of judgment. It shall come quickly, suddenly, without warning. There will be no time to repent. No time to make things right with God. No time to get your affairs in order. When the day of judgment arrives, all time stops. Whatever you've done in life will be frozen in place for eternity. Unless you have repented of your sins. There won't be a seven-year tribulation during which people get saved. Now, the Dipsyites teach that Jesus comes to earth secretly to rapture the church to heaven, and the church lives in heaven for seven years during a tribulation on the earth. But people are getting saved during the tribulation. All the Jews get saved. And then Jesus comes back to earth a third time. 
to set up this kingdom of Israel in old Jerusalem. And Israel rules the world for a thousand years. Then Satan is released to deceive people again. And then the wicked are judged at the end of a thousand years. My friend, that stuff is nonsense. It's nonsense. Don't believe it. Jesus Christ returns one time, not twice. When he returns, all the graves shall open. The graves of every human being who ever lived since the Garden of Eden. The good, the bad, and the ugly. They're all coming out. They're all coming out of their graves at one time. Now, if you don't believe me, will you believe St. John? In John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, the apostle said, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. When do the graves open? When the dead hear the voice of Jesus, when he shouts that he has returned. Who comes out? All who are in the graves will come out. Is it only the righteous who come out when Jesus returns? No, all come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. See, there's resurrection for both groups. There's a resurrection to life and a resurrection to judgment. The great separation of souls happens when Jesus shouts and the graves open. It doesn't happen 1,000 years after Jesus returns. The Bible is very clear. It's easy to understand. Now come back tomorrow for part two of this lesson, the coming great separation of souls. The Bible has a lot to say about what happens to souls when Jesus returns. The Word of God will speak to you and untangle all those knots that the Dipsyites have tied in your brain. My friend, Christianity is easy to understand. You have to become religious to make it confusing and difficult. So chill out, enjoy life, this life that God has given you, glorify him with the way you live and talk. He's coming back. And when he returns, every human, those who are alive when he returns and every human that has lived in past times, everyone will be separated into one of, of two piles. Which pile will you be in? Come back tomorrow and I'll continue this Bible study on the coming great separation of souls. Thank you for watching Morning Manna. Please remember, the day is coming very soon that we will not be on YouTube, Facebook, and other social media platforms. The thought police are aggressively shutting down those of us who preach the gospel. So for now, go to truenews.com to see Morning Manna. In several months, we will have an even bigger and better platform ready for you, and Morning Manna will be there too. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. God bless. I'll see you tomorrow. Lesson two. Welcome to morning manna. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. My topic today is the coming great separation of souls. This is part two. Many people in the USA are alarmed over the Utah Data Center, also known officially as the Intelligence Community Comprehensive National Cybersecurity Initiative Data Center, located in Bluffdale, Utah. When fully constructed, the NSA's massive data repository will occupy 1.5 million square feet of space. It will require 65 megawatts of electricity, costing Washington, $40 million per year for electricity. It will use 1.7 million gallons of water per day. And listen to this. It will contain the data storage capacity of 12 exabytes. What's an exabyte? I've never heard of an exabyte. Well, that's a lot of data. Well, what kind of data is the NSA storing in Utah? Well, they can't tell us. It's a secret, you know. But according to NSA whistleblower James Banford, the Utah Data Center is able to process, quote, 
all forms of communication, including the complete contents of private emails, cell phone calls, internet searches, as well as all types of personal, personal data trails, parking receipts, travel itineraries, bookstore purchases, and other digital pocket litter. I've never heard of digital pocket litter. Yes, the NSA is actually going to go down to the bottom of your pocket and get out all of the digital lint that you have in your pocket. I mean, they're, think about it. Parking receipts. Everything you do is being stored in Utah. Well, citizens have a right to be alarmed and concerned about the data the NSA is collecting and storing on us. But my response is that the folks at the NSA ought to be fearful of the vast data storage in almighty God's mind because he sees everything that they're doing and he has stored video files in his mind and they will be held accountable on judgment day. The good news, my friend, is that there is a sure way to delete stuff from God's massive data storage system in heaven. It's called repentance. You need to hit the repentance key often every day. Delete those files of your thoughts, words, and deeds, and you don't have to worry about Judgment Day. Well, we're talking about the separation of souls. There is coming a day that there will be a separation of souls. And this day will come quickly, suddenly, without warning. Either you know it's coming and you're prepared for it, or it's going to catch you off guard. And if, you know what, for the people that have already died, well, it's, it's over. Everything that they've done in life, it's already finished. The records are sealed in heaven. There's nothing that they can do about it. Listen, nobody praying you out of purgatory is going to help. Whatever you did in life, when you get in your casket, it's over, it's done. Your life is finished and the files are stored in heaven. That's why you have to repent today because you don't know when you're going to get inside a casket. Now, the New Testament scriptures contain many references to a great separation of humanity that will take place, as I said, suddenly, without warning, at the end of the age. And only the wise righteous will be prepared for it. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, John the Baptist warned the religious elite about this coming day of separation of souls. He said, and now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down, cast into the fire. Indeed, I baptize you with water unto repentance but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. In the 13th chapter of the Gospel of our Lord, according to St. Matthew, Jesus spoke in parables about the kingdom of heaven. In one parable, he talked about a sower who went out to sow seed. And some seeds fell beside the path. Some seeds fell on rocky ground. Some seed fell on, among thorns. And some seeds fell into good ground. Starting in verse 24, Jesus told them another parable. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. But when the shoots had sprung up and produced fruit, the weeds appeared. So the servants of the landowner, the servants of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? Then where did the weeds come from? He said to them, An enemy did this. The servants said to him, Will you then have us go and gather them up? But he said, no, that's while you gather up the weeds, you pull up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. 
And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles and burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Starting in verse 36, Jesus explained the parable about the weeds sowed among the wheat. Then Jesus sent the crowds away and went into the house. And his disciples came to him and saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. Verse 37, he answered, he who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed are the sons of the kingdom. But the weeds are the sons of the evil one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels. This is really easy to understand, isn't it? Very clear. Verse 40. Therefore, as the weeds are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send out his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who do evil, and will throw them into a fiery furnace. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was cast into the sea. This is verse 47. The kingdom of heaven is like a net that was cast into the sea and gathered all kinds of fish. When it was full, they drew it to the shore, sat down and gathered the good into baskets, but threw the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. My friend, the reason God does not judge the wicked right now is because he's waiting until the end of the age. He is deliberately allowing the weeds to grow alongside the wheat. Born again, baptized, commandment-keeping Christians are the wheat. And God knows that if he sends judgment to the wicked now, the wheat will suffer. When Jesus returns, his angels will gather the good into baskets and throw away the bad. They will separate the evil from the righteous and throw the evil into the lake of fire. And there, the evil people will wail and gnash their teeth forever with no hope of escape from their torment. Now, when you examine Matthew 13, verses 29 and 30, you'll see that the angelic reapers first gather the wicked. They are bundled and burned it says, but he said, no, lest while you gather up the weeds, you pull up the wheat also with them. Let both grow until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather up the weeds first. Bind them in bundles and burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. That scripture right there has <laughs> blew away. Left behind movie. Matthew 16, verses 24 and 27. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay every man according to his works. The great separation of souls is coming at the end of the age. In Matthew 25, Jesus said the entire human population from Adam until the people who are alive when he comes through the eastern sky, all of humanity will be separated into two groups. When the son, this is verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. Before Him will be gathered all nations and He will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates his sheep from the goats. 
He will set the sheep at his right hand, but the goats at the left. Again, here we have a, an example of God separating humanity. The separation of souls that happens when he returns. Not a thousand years later after he returns, but immediately when he returns. Verse 41, then he will say to those at the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. The two groups will go into two different directions and enter two different existence for eternity. Verse 46, and they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. We'll come back tomorrow for part three of the coming great separation of souls. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Lesson three. Well, welcome to morning manna. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Our topic is the coming great separation of souls. This is the third and final lesson. The New Testament scripture is very clear and concise about what will happen to souls when Jesus returns. Scripture is also very clear and concise about when these things will happen. I'm not referring to a date, but the sequence and order of last things. Unfortunately, the Dipsyites in America have muddied the waters for a lot of people. Their dispensational, premillennial, pre-tribulation Zionism eschatology has confused millions of people about what happens when Jesus Christ returns. Have you ever studied one of their end-time prophecy timeline charts? Wow! It'll make your eyeballs spin in circles. Their complicated charts are full of things that they say must happen before Jesus Christ returns and after he returns. The Dipsyites teach that the righteous will be judged when Jesus returns, but the unsaved souls will be judged a thousand years later. They teach that there will be unsaved people living in the kingdom for a thousand years. They teach that people will be having babies. They teach that Satan will be released at the end of a thousand years and people will follow Satan. They're going to leave Jesus and follow Satan. This Jewish fable goes on and on and on with religious nonsense. Jesus and the apostles told us precisely what will happen at the end of the age. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses uh, 1 through 14, uh, excuse me, 14 through 16. For if we believe that Jesus died and arose again, so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Now, verse 17, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall be forever with the Lord. John 5, verses 28, 29, tells us that all graves, all graves will open when Jesus descends from heaven with a shout. All bodies will come out, the bodies of the righteous and the bodies of the unsaved sinners. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Very clear, isn't it? All come out of the graves. In Matthew 13, verses 37 through 43, Jesus told us who will do what to whom at the end of the age. His words are so simple and easy to understand that a five-year-old could teach it. Verse 37, Jesus said, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seed are the sons of the kingdom. 
The weeds are the sons of the evil one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. The reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the weeds are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send out his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who do evil, and will throw them into a fiery furnace. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, if you go up a few verses in Matthew 13, go up to verses 29, 30, Jesus told us that the angelic reapers first gather the wicked. They will be bundled and burned. It says, but he said, no, lest while you gather up the weeds, you pull up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather up the weeds first and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Now drop down a few verses in Matthew 13, and Jesus gives us another lesson about the coming great separation of souls. Starting in verse 47, Jesus said again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was cast into the sea and gathered all kinds of fish. When it was full, they drew it to shore, sat down, and gathered the good into baskets, but threw the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. What do we learn from these verses? We learn that humanity is divided between wheat and weeds. Weeds will be bundled and burned in fire. Humanity is divided between good fish and bad fish. The good fish will be placed in baskets, but the bad fish will be thrown away. We learn that angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw the evil people into the lake of fire. In Matthew 16, 27, it says, For the Son of Man shall come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay every man according to his works. Uh, once again, the separation of souls. We will be paid according to our works. Did you know that Jesus will ask every human being who has ever lived a question when he returns? You can read it in Matthew 25. He will ask everybody if they fed the hungry, visited the sick and the imprisoned, clothed the naked, gave water to thirsty children. Jesus said that all humanity, from the beginning of the human race until the end of the age, will be gathered as nations and then separated into two groups, sheep and goats. Matthew 25, verses 31, 33, When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. Before him will be gathered all nations, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd separates his sheep from the goats. He will set the sheep at his right hand, but the goats at the left. Verse 41 warns, Then he will say to those at the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. My friend, the two groups will go in two different directions and enter a different existence for eternity. Verse 46 says, and they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Souls were separated and sent different ways. Jesus also gave us a parable about a wedding feast that shows us another Example of the coming great separation of souls. Matthew 22, verses 8 through 14. Jesus told the disciples that a separation will happen when the wedding feast is ready to begin. It says, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the streets and invite to the wedding banquet as many as you find. So those servants went out into the streets and gathered together as many as they found, both good and bad. So the wedding Hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guest, he saw a man 
who was not wearing wedding garments. He said to him, friend, how did you get in here without wedding garments? And he was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called, but few are chosen. In Matthew 24, Jesus gives us a description of the final moments prior to his appearance. He said, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Verse 30, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Verse 31, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And here we go again. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from, the one, from one end of heaven to the other, a separation of souls. In the gospel of our Lord, according to St. Luke, Jesus gave us another example of souls being separated at the end of the age. This is found in Luke 17, verses 26 through 37. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was in the days of Lot, they ate, drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot departed from Sodom, fire and brimstone rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, let him who is on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away. And likewise, let him who is in the field not return to the things behind. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night, two men will be in one bed. The one will be taken, the other will be left. Two women will be grinding grain together. The one will be taken, and the other will be left. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. They asked, where, Lord? And he replied, where the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. My friend, the end of the age of mankind will come suddenly, without warning. It will catch most people off guard. Despite the obvious signs, spiritual blindness will prevent them from seeing the signs, but the righteous will recognize the signs and be ready. The parable of the ten virgins is another example to us about the separation of souls. All ten were waiting on the Lord's return, but only five were ready when the shout was made that the bridegroom had arrived. Personally, I interpret this parable of the virgins as representing two groups of souls in the church. One group is saved and ready. The other group is religious they think they're saved, but they're not ready. The questions that you and I must ask ourselves is, am I ready? Which group am I in? Wheat or weeds? Good fish or bad fish? Righteous or wicked? Wise virgin or foolish virgin? Let us live quiet and peaceful lives and present to those people around us that are unsaved, a good witness. Let us, in the words of St. Paul, work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. And let us not wish and hope for the day of the Lord. Amos 5 verse 18 says, Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. In verse 20, says, shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? We must not desire to see the wicked punished. 
God is allowing them to dwell alongside the saints. We are presently in the age of God's sin amnesty. Unconditional pardon of sins is ready, readily available to any and all who will come to Jesus, confess their sins and repent, and turn from their wicked ways. Second Peter chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. My friend, the day of the Lord shall come. It shall come at God's appointed time. Nobody knows the day and the hour. When it arrives, it will be sudden and without warning. Every human who has ever lived will be separated into one of two groups. The righteous will enter eternal life with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The unsaved will be cast into the lake of fire and no escape. The world will be like it was in the days of Noah. They didn't see the flood coming, even though Noah preached it to them for decades. Matthew 24, 36, 41. As I quoted earlier, concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. As were the days of Noah, so will it be the coming of the Son of Man, for as it as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Two will be in the field, one taken, one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Once again, we see the separation of souls. Two in the field, one taken, one left. Two grinding at the mill, one taken, one left. And by the way, I think the one that's taken is unsaved. He or she is bundled and burned. I think the one that is left behind is saved. So that contradicts the late Tim LaHaye's left behind fiction books and movies. Remember, it's just fiction. The key thing I desire you to understand is that a great separation of souls shall take place the moment Jesus returns. It will be sudden, without warning, quick and permanent. If you are not living a righteous life before the Lord, I implore you to repent of your sins. Ask God to forgive you. Turn from your wicked ways. Ask God to deliver you from whatever temptations beset you. Thank you for watching Morning Manna. Now, YouTube has banned True News, and I was informed today that Reddit has banned True News. I don't know how long we'll be on Facebook. Yes, Satan is separating people too. He's banning the righteous from using his platforms. Well, that's okay. They're his platforms. We build our own platform, and, we, and it will be unveiled very soon. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace.